Hello everybody. Happy Saturday. Like what day is it? Um, so I have been really wanting to jump on here um, for a while and uh, especially this month being that May is Melanoma Awareness Month and um, this month has flown by <laughs> between working from home, um, David and me working from home and um, parenting Max 24-7 and um, just trying to balance life right now. Um, I have not been as um, outspoken and um, I, I'm always dedicated, but I've not been able to share as much skin cancer and melanoma awareness um, this year as I've wanted to. For those of you that have known me for years, you know that every year in May I share not just my own personal melanoma story, but I share stories of my friends, I share statistics, I share awareness and just tips on how to prevent um, yourself from going through melanoma um, or someone in your family or someone that you love. Um, but like I said, being that this last month has been a little bit less than normal, um, I have not had the bandwidth to, um, to do what I normally do. Um, ironically though, I did have my six month um, skin check uh, last week, which I did post about. And again, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody who um, gave me support. Uh, I've always shared my, um, my my pictures and my my biopsy stories with y'all. I mean, this has been going on. Uh, I was diagnosed January 23rd, January, wow. July 23rd, God, mom brain. See, I have an excuse now. Um, July 23rd, 2008, so um, coming up on 12 years and um, I turned 30 on July 1st, 2008, so literally, um, it was like a week and a half after my 30th birthday, I had the biopsy and then um, almost two weeks later, I found out that it was melanoma. And um, for a lot of my friends in the cancer world only know me because I'm in the cancer, the cancer world. Um, they didn't know me before that. So, um, you know, I've always been a pretty open person, um, pretty expressive uh, with my face and my voice, but um, this was different. It actually took me two years um, after my diagnosis, after my surgery, um, to really realize that I needed to find like an outlet and to, um, you know, find a way to like get my feelings out, get my emotions out, um, eventually tell my story because I went through a lot of like weird, I mean, those two years were really dark. I was scared to literally scared to go outside. There was so much less information. The, the resources back then, even in 2008, were nothing like um, they are now. So, I mean, back then I was living in San Diego. Um, I had only been there for about two years. So you can imagine I'm living like 16 blocks from the beach. I just turned 30. I have no family there and I get diagnosed with cancer. <laughs> um, so I, I mean, I was terrified. I was a total, um, admittedly, admittedly a sun worshiper. Um, I, um, my obsession or whatever you want to call it with, with being tan, um, started when I was in high school and, um, my son, and I'm going to jump all over the place because I've been wanting to do this for so long and I finally have time. Max is in bed. David's on a Zoom call with his buddies. Um, they do this every Saturday. So I'm like, I finally have time by myself <laughs> to jump on here and just let all this out. Um, a lot of you have heard my story before. So if you have, you don't have to listen, but feel free to listen. Um, and for those of you that don't know it, here it is. So, um, so yeah, I was starting in my sophomore year of high school. I remember I was, we were getting ready for our sophomore dance and I went to an all girls Catholic high school in St. Louis, Missouri, where I'm from. And sophomore dance was like the first dance that you got to have. You didn't have, we didn't have dances as freshmen. So it was a big deal. And, um, I see there's a couple girls who went to St. Joe that are watching right now. So, um, y'all remember this. Um, it was a big deal and it was in February in St. Louis. So like 
you know, we're all super pale. It's winter. Um, I couldn't drive yet because I had a late summer birthday. So my mom, and this is the ironic part, which you'll understand why later, but my mom actually said she would take me to a tanning salon by our house um, to go like two times before the dance. I mean, knowing what I know now, that was not going to get me tan um, or tan enough uh, for a dance. But I had this like mermaid purple sequin dress and I was, you know, I was going to try to get some color. Um, so that was my very first time going to the tanning bed. I was 15 years old. Um, and fast forward to my 30th birthday. I have some very crappy photos of that weekend because this was like pre iPhone days. Um, and, but I was so tan. Like I look back on that weekend and it just blows my mind. Um, for those of you that know me now, I mean, this is my natural skin color. I don't, I don't use tanning creams. I don't even do the fake, fake stuff anymore because I just don't like having that stuff on my skin. And it took me a long time to finally embrace what I actually look like. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I, for 15 solid years, I went tanning for every major occasion, um, school dances, then I got to college, you know, the sorority events, um, whatever it was, it didn't matter. Anytime I was going to be photographed, um, you know, even I remember going, um, before my sister's wedding in 2006, um, I was in Denver with her that week and we went to the tanning salon together. I mean, it just, it makes me sick because for those of you that don't know, um, if you go to a tanning bed just one time before the age of 35, you increase your risk of melanoma by like 75%. I mean, the statistics are insane. And to think about the amount of times that I went to a tanning bed, I it like literally makes me sick to my stomach now knowing what I know now and knowing the fair incredibly fair and freckly skin that I have I can't believe that I did that first of all I can't believe that my parents let me do it um but back then like the, like I said the education wasn't there um I have a very vivid memory of my um I think it was my freshman or sophomore year in high school um, coming back to school after spring break and um, my one of our teachers at my high school she was a riot but I remember a lot of girls had gone away on trips and they were coming back super tan I was jealous because I didn't go anywhere and um, so I just looked normal I mean it was March in St. Louis I certainly wasn't tan and I remember we came in that morning and everybody's back and there's girls like peeling you know and they've got like their um you know, their, their lips and every, everything's peeling and they got like the scabs and the, and I was jealous of them. I mean, it's crazy. And I remember this teacher said, you girls are so crazy with your tanning. You know, you're going to die of skin cancer. It, it's so nuts that I remember this because I mean, back then all I wanted was to be tan, but I remember one of the girls in my class raised her hand and she's like, yeah, but at least I'll die tan. And all the girls laughed and it like, it's crazy to think about that now because now I actually have friends that have died from being tan. I've had friends who have died because they um, did exactly what I did um, or some version of that. They didn't take care of their skin. They didn't know um, the warning signs. They didn't catch their melanoma soon enough at the early stage. Um, you know, melanoma has no cure and that's what a lot of people don't understand. It's, it's not like you're just fixed. Like for me, because we caught mine so early, 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 like when, when you hear about stages of cancer and you hear somebody say, I have stage three breast cancer, or I have stage two, um, I don't know another example. There's so many cancers. Um, um, but for me, mine was like stage zero. And so imagine like millimeters of depth in your skin. Like you, I can't even make that that measurement with my fingernails, but millimeters. So my melanoma was so, so superficial on, on my skin. It was on my calf, uh, my leg, um, which by the way is the number one place that women get melanoma is on their legs. Usually it's the lower legs because that's what's exposed the most. Just FYI, um, the number one spot that men get it is on their back because they're often shirtless and they can't reach back there 
to put sunscreen on or they just don't. Um, and over time, over time, over time, it builds and builds. But for me, um, I'm trying to think where I even was with that, where I was going with that. Um, so yeah, so mine was early, early stage, right? So um, I had what's called an excision surgery, which um, mine was very, not very invasive compared to some people. Um, but I had a pretty good chunk taken out of my calf and I had a, I still have the scar, but I mean, the scar is what it is. It's, I am fine with scars now. I have many more of them, but, um, they took a big chunk out of my calf because what they have to do is they have to go, the biopsy took the mole off, but what happened was the edges of the mole, were, there was, there were not clear margins. So there were still cancer cells that were close enough to the edge or going off the edge of the biopsy that they had to go back in and take out more because they want to make sure they get it all. So I went from my primary care doctor who honestly thought my mole was nothing, but I basically told them like, my mom doesn't like this mole. You have to, you have to cut it off. Um, so he did, but my mom was the one that noticed it. So that's why I say the irony of all this. My mom was the one that actually took me to my first tanning appointment when I was 15. But then my mom was also the person who, um, when my parents were visiting me in San Diego in the summer of 2008 and, um, we're a big golfing family and the U S open was at Torrey Pines. That's the year that tiger won, um, in sudden death on Monday. If any of you care about golf or cared about tiger woods back then, you know what I'm talking about, but we are a big golf family. So my parents had come out for um, the weekend to go to the U S open. It's father's day weekend, like big weekend, right? Well, my mom noticed the mole on my leg while I was at their hotel room hanging out with them. And she was just like, like radar vision across the room was like, Kristen, what the hell is that? And I had, I mean, I didn't even know what she was talking about. And, um, she's like on your leg. And so I looked down and I saw it. I mean, it was there and it was not some people asked me like, what did it look like? It was not some big, ugly, scary, like monster jumping out at you. Like a lot of people think skin cancer has to be this big, ugly thing on your skin, which it can be, but mine was seriously the size of like, most of my freckles, like, I don't know if y'all can see any of those, but I mean, I have a lot of freckles, but it was not any bigger than any other freckle I had on my body. In fact, I have other ones that are bigger. Um, but what was, what jumped out at her was the coloring. So most of my freckles are some shade of brown. I mean, I even have some on my face. Um, I have them everywhere, but it was black. Like it was like you had taken a black Sharpie and like drawn a perfect little circle on there. And so if you know the ABCs of melanoma, um, A is asymmetry, B is border, C is color, D is diameter. So if it has a weird border, um, sorry, let's go back to A. If it's asymmetrical, which this one wasn't, it was a perfect circle. Um, if it has a weird border, this one didn't. It was just a black circle, smooth edges. Um, the, but the color, the C of it, the color was different different from me. Like I didn't, I don't have, or I didn't have black moles. So my mom knew that that color wasn't right. Um, the D for diameter is like, if you have something that's bigger than a pencil eraser, which this was not. Um, and then they've actually gone even further into the A, B, C, D, E's now of melanoma and E is evolution. So, um, if something that you've, maybe you've had something your whole life and suddenly it changes, it evolves. Um, or you've had something for a month, but it changes. So any kind of evolution. So if, if you have a mole or anything on your skin that basically falls under any of those categories, it doesn't have to match them all. And honestly, my only, my only one that lined up on that was the C was the color. So it did it. She didn't like it. I promised her I'd get it looked at but I had my 30th birthday party weekend coming up and it was a party weekend. Let me just tell you, I think I was still hung over on Monday when I went back to work. Um, but I worked in the beer industry, so it was, it was part of the, part of the deal. But anyway, I digress. So, um, I finally went, so my birthday was July 1st, July 11th. I went and I had the biopsy. It was a Friday afternoon. I had finished my sales route early and I went and I got it cut off. And I went to happy hour <laughs> in Old Town. For those of you from San Diego who know, I went to Old Town and went to happy hour. Cause I mean, I was just like, I have a bandaid on my leg, whatever. I mean, it was the tiniest little cut. Um, it didn't hurt. 
barely bled. It was just this tiny, they just shaved it off. He numbed it a little bit, shaved it off, done, harmless. Um, I've had probably 35 or more of those done since then. Still doesn't hurt. I mean, if you go to a good dermatologist, they know what they're doing. And I was at a primary care doctor, so thank God he knew what he was doing. Um, so anyways, where was I? So, um, a week or so goes by, I haven't heard anything. And they had told me like, no news is good news. If we don't, um, if you don't hear from us, you're fine. Well, first of all, excuse my language. That's bullshit. When doctors tell you that, that is a very unfair way of basically saying, um, good luck waiting and not being a nervous wreck. So I spent the next week or so just being like, oh, they haven't called me. I'm probably fine. Then a couple more days went by and my mom was just like, have they called you? Have they called you? You need to find out what, you know, what's going on. And I was like, yeah, 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 mom, whatever. Well, the next week rolls around. So this time it's like the 23rd of, of January. So it's been almost two weeks since the biopsy. And my mom is like, you seriously need to, um, you need to find out. She just knew my mom, like now that I am a mom, I totally understand this motherly instinct, that feeling in your gut that something is not right or um, something is off, like you can't fight it. It's legit. It's completely legit. I completely now, I now I know. Um, with Max, I like, I have that feeling now. So anyways, um, she knew. So um, I, like I said, I was working for Budweiser. Um, I got home from my working my sales route and I was still sitting in my car. I was in the, my parking spot. I lived in, in PB in San Diego, <laughs> this crappy apartment. But anyways, I was still sitting in the parking lot because I realized, oh my God, it's almost five o'clock. It was literally like 4.59 and they closed at five. So I just called really fast and I was just like, hey, I'm just calling about my biopsy. And um, the nurse was like, uh, just a second. So she comes back and I will never forget her words because Back then, I think I watched ER. That was maybe the only hospital show I watched back then. But um, I knew enough to know that like when doctors call you or when, when you call a doctor's office and they're like, we're gonna need you to come in and see us, that's not good news. So she comes back on and she literally says, yeah, we're gonna need you to come back and see us. Can you come back tomorrow morning? And I was like, oh my God. And so, and so she said, you know, we aren't supposed to give test results over the phone, which now a lot of times they will um, because it's just easier. I mean, with our, the way our system is now, it's it's a lot easier to just tell somebody over the phone than to um, have to schedule an appointment and bring them in and charge a copay and the whole thing. So she's like, let me hold on a second. So she had to go and get special permission, I guess, to tell me. So she comes back on and she's like, okay, so it's melanoma. And you know, it's crazy because at the time, all I knew was that that was bad. Like I didn't know if I knew then what I know now, I probably would have passed out in my car because like I said now, I mean, and I've said it in all my posts. So if any of y'all read to the end of my posts, you hear me say that one person dies of melanoma every hour, like every single hour, you guys, this is not, this is no joke. Like I don't know how long I'll be on here talking. Knowing me, I talk a lot, so it can be a while. But I might be on here like 20 minutes. That's, I mean, there's, what, three 20-minute periods in an hour? So that's not very much. So like in the, the 20 minutes that I'm talking to y'all, it could be one more person. And you might think like, oh, one person, what's one person? But like, I was one person. And my friends who have passed away from this disease, they're one person. And my friends who are fighting for their life because of this freaking disease, they're one person. And their dads and their moms and their sons and daughters and their brothers and sisters, like, they have family. They have people that love them. And um, so what may not seem like a big deal to you because it's, oh, it's just one person. It's, you know, it's somebody else. Um, that could be you. It could be someone that you love. So it is a big deal. And um, and I, I, like I said, I'm going to be all over the place. I'm usually very organized. Um I was a cancer survivor speaker in San Diego for like four years and I probably did over 50 speeches um, at Relay for Life events and um, corporate wellness events and just different school events and different things um, to share my story and share awareness and help generate, you know, 
fundraising dollars and um, ideally to help save people's lives. But um, I haven't gotten to do that since I really that much since I've been in Austin. And so um, I've been really feeling like the urge to get back on and do it. So again, this is not an organized speech. This is just me going off the cuff. Um, so anyways, um, where was I? <laughs> that's, that's what I meant by the fact that I'm warning you, it's going to be very jumbled, but, um, but yeah, so as I mentioned, um, my mom noticed my mole, she knew the warning signs of skin cancer. Um, and I mentioned that one person dies of melanoma every hour. So you're asking how can somebody die from skin cancer? I know a lot of people will ask me that, or they think that they're like, it's just skin cancer. It's not just skin cancer. So there are three main types of skin cancer, basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma. Very, very rarely can those be fatal. They can be, but it's, it is like, I mean, very, very rare. Um, those are much more surface level on your skin, but they can be pretty invasive. They can involve pretty yucky surgeries. Um, my husband, David had a basal cell, um, carcinoma removed from the top of his head. Um, I think it was December of 2016. It was right after we had moved here. And, um, so he still, he still has a big dent in the top of his head. I mean, he had to get it removed. He had to have stitches. Um, it was, he was in and out. Thankfully, it was also pretty early. Um, so they didn't have to dig any deeper, but I mean, some of those non-melanoma skin cancers, I mean, they can, they might have to cut a lot of skin and a lot of tissue out. And when that's on your face, your head, um, other parts of your body that maybe are visible a lot, it can be very scarring and very, um, disfiguring. So just on a level of vanity, I mean, most people don't want a chunk taken out of their face. Um, and you can't really see the, the one on top of David's head, but, um, I just wanted to give an example of something that wasn't melanoma. Cause I mostly just talk about melanoma, but, um, but at the time I was diagnosed, we didn't have a family history of melanoma. Um, I was the first in my family. So, um, ironically, my mom, not ironically, but kind of, um, it's been since I've lived here, but my mom actually called me a couple years ago and was like, Hey, they found a melanoma on my arm. She's since had one other one. Um, my sister has had, thankfully not melanoma, but she's had some severe, um, they call them severe dysplastic moles. So it's basically like a mole that's really angry and it's working its way to becoming, um, melanoma. Um, it's basically like precancerous, but hers were pretty severe. So they were like, they were getting there. My dad has had countless basal cell and squamous cell, um, removed, um, from his ears, from the back of his neck, um, from his temple. That one involved a pretty, pretty good chunk of surgery to get rid of all the cancer cells. Um, so I know, um, some other relatives have had basal cells like on their lips and other parts of their face. And, um, so apparently skin cancer does run in my family or it, it, we may be genetically more prone to it, but, um, you know, yes, we are white and we are fair. Um, I did not inherit the, um, the Albert French nice brown skin like my grandpa had and my aunt has and many of my cousins have. I did not get that skin. Um, but let me just say on the topic of skin color that you do not have to look like me to get melanoma or skin cancer. Um, it doesn't matter. In fact, it doesn't really matter what color your skin is. You might be more likely to get it because you're more likely to burn. You're more likely to, um, get skin damage from the sun when you're pale or fair. I, fair is probably a better word, but, um, what people, a lot of people don't realize is, um, anybody of any skin color can get skin cancer, especially melanoma. Um, Bob Marley died from melanoma that went untreated. It was on his toe. Um, I don't know that. I mean, I know the story, but it's, it's from other people's accounts. So I don't know, like if it was his decision, I believe it was his decision to not have it treated, but I, I don't know, but regardless it spread. So melanoma, when it decides to spread, um, it typically goes to the nearest lymph nodes in your body, which, you know, your lymph nodes basically stretch across your entire body. 
So for me, if mine had spread to my lymph nodes, it probably would have gone to the like my groin area. Um, but melanoma also really likes the liver, it likes the lungs, and it likes the brain. It, it can go to other places too, including bones. I mean, it's it is evil, you guys. Like, it, there's the St. Louis and me coming out, you guys. I say y'all now, but um, I just said you guys. It makes me makes me a little sim um, sentimental when I say you guys now. But anyways, back to the story. Sorry. <laughs> um, so yeah, melanoma, I mean, it, it doesn't spread. It doesn't become necessarily this massive thing that you can see on your skin. It spreads down. It spreads inward. Um, it can get into your bloodstream, your lymphatic system, and it just goes wherever it wants. So um, it is scary shit you guys and um my friends who have passed away from it i mean it's just it's not pretty i mean the ones that are still fighting it like they're they're in treatment after treatment clinical trial after clinical trial like it's just it's a never ending battle because there are um there's still so much that um isn't understood about it and it's just very hard to treat um, people's certain people's bodies, just like every other cancer, don't don't respond very well um, to the treatment, and so it just keeps spreading. Um, and I know that I I've said this, but it's been almost twelve years for me. But um, mine, as I said, was stage zero. It's called in situ. It means like at the site. So mine was like literally surface level, top top layer of skin being scraped off that was that. The biopsy actually probably got almost all of it, but that's beside the point. There could be microscopic melanoma cells still hanging out in there somewhere or that had maybe moved around before my surgery. And they could, it could pop up anywhere at any time, either on my skin or internally. So I'm, you're never completely in the clear. So, um, one of the, if you can find a silver lining with having melanoma is, um, dermatologists pay really good attention to you. <laughs> they give you very, um, or they should, um, they give you lots of really good attention. Um, they're, they're a lot more, um, thorough with you. And again, they should be because, um, they should be with everyone, but, um, I mean, you're never totally in the clear. So when I post, you know, my six month skin checks and I'm getting these biopsies and, Knock on wood, y'all. They've come. They've all come back to this point. Um, okay, except for um, I had a few that I had to have like um, like re reshaved or or whatever to make sure they got them all. Um, but I've been very lucky. But I am covered in precancerous moles. Like there's a bunch that we're watching that we know I'm I'm gonna have to have removed at some point. Um, my chest area is definitely not super freckly, which is surprising considering all the tanning I did um, back in the day. Um, and I, I talked about my tanning spa stuff, but I laid out in the sun a lot too. Like a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, and I had some sunburns. And in my, my version of tan was more like a reddish <laughs> brown because I'm so fair. So, um, but, um, I got a lot of sun damage and, and I, my last visit, my dermatologist actually said that my chest while not being covered in moles probably has some very, very deep. In fact, probably it does. It has very, very deep sun damage and DNA cellular damage that I did to it all those years. And so at some point we may have to start even doing like, um, like a chemotherapy creams or certain light treatments on that part of my body to help maybe stop the precancerous cells that we know are growing there, maybe stop them in their tracks um, and start kind of um, like start over, like get rid of that layer or those layers of skin and start fresh because it's only a matter of time before something pops up there. So I guess my point is, is that um, I know one of my friends commented on my recent post and said that um, cause I had the biopsy on my leg and then one on my on my butt. And she said, yeah, I have, I have a mole that my, my dermatologist is watching on my butt too. And, and, um, she said, it's so funny because, um, that's a place that the sun doesn't really see. Well, if you were a tanning bed user like me, then it certainly got seen. 
But even if you weren't, um, you know, swimsuits aren't exactly, um, you know, protecting you completely. Clothing does help um, protect you from the sun, but not completely. It's not a shield. It's better than nothing, though. Um, and sunscreen, obviously, is a huge way to protect yourself, but, um, but it's not, it's not everything. So, um, I have friends still and it just, it, you guys, it hurts, it hurts me. It hurts my brain. It hurts my heart. I have friends still that'll be like, Oh, I laid out yesterday, but I wore sunscreen, sunscreen, Kristen. So you'd be proud of me. And I'm like, no, 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 no. It, laying out like y'all, the, the days of sunbathing and getting a base tan and get like there, there is no safe tan. Like don't do it. It's not worth it. Um, any change of skin color is your skin's way of saying it's had too much. Like it's, it's cellular damage. It's DNA damage. Like you are putting, you're setting the tone for what could happen later. And unfortunately for me, I, I did it for 15 years, 15 years. And I was a golfer, like a very serious golfer. So I was out in the sun playing golf all the time. So I had an amazing golfer's tan that I was very proud of. <laughs> um, I had very white feet and, um, but, um, but then I would work on my tan, my regular tan otherwise. And so, um, my tan lines were like a badge of honor for me, especially also because, um, when I was tan, um, people would, thanks V. I am seeing your comments, y'all. I promise. I'm just trying to get all these thoughts out, um, of my head. Um, but I still see people laying out. I was taking Max on a walk the other day and y'all, you better believe he is protected when we take walks. He's got his canopy over him. His legs are covered up with a, um, I tie like a, this blanket thing over his legs. Um, there's no ounce of sun hitting him. Um, but anyways, and I'm covered up. I'm always in like long sleeves and I've got pants on and it's hot and I got my big hat, my sunglasses and my sunscreen and but I was out on this walk and I saw this girl and she's real, she's this cute girl. She's one of our neighbors and she can't be more than like, she's definitely under 30. <laughs> I'm 41. So, um, I'm allowed to say that she was a cute girl, but she was laying out in the sun in her yard and she had her face in the shade, but her body was in the sun. And I see people do that. They have their big sun hats on to protect their face, but then the rest of them is getting fried. And it's like, I didn't protect any of myself back in the day, <laughs> but, um, anyways, um, I guess my point is that protecting your face is great if you're worried about wrinkles and obviously sun damage and skin cancer, but like your skin is everywhere. Um, it's the largest organ in your body. It does not forget y'all. So there's a lot of treatments now you can, you can do at your dermatologist to help reverse, um, sun damage. There's, products that people are selling and companies are selling that like maybe remove like age spots and things from your skin. And that's great. But I mean, here's the deal. The damage is already done. So I mean, what you did to your skin 10, 15 years ago might still be showing up now. So you might've had the best skincare routine ever for the last year or five years or 10 years. But think about when you were a kid, have you ever been sunburned? I know very few people that can say no. Um, have you ever been to a tanning bed even once? You're at higher risk now. Do you have a family history of any kind of skin cancer? Um, you know, are you fair skin? Unfortunately, yes. Those of us that are, we are at higher risk. But again, as I mentioned, Bob Marley died from melanoma that was untreated. So it can happen to anyone. And the scary thing is, is a lot of times people with darker skin, um, if they do have melanoma, by the time they find it or notice it or actually get it checked, because a lot of times they don't think that they need to get checked, it's far, it's farther along. It's more advanced. It potentially is involving a much more invasive surgery. It might be involving having lymph nodes removed. It could be involving um, chemo, other horrible treatments. So um, I just kind of wanted to paint a picture that this is not, you don't have to look like me for this to happen to you. You don't have to have been a sun worshiper. I know some of y'all smart people out there maybe never lay down in the sun. You Maybe you never um, went to the tanning bed. If so, thank God. Good for you. I'm glad. But that doesn't mean that you cannot get skin cancer. I mean, 
driving in our cars, um, you know, doing yard work, playing sports as kids, um, you know, taking walks during the day, whatever it is you're doing, like it's cumulative damage over years of time that is becoming skin cancer. Um, yes, kids can get skin cancer. Yes, babies can be born with melanoma. That's a whole nother topic. I don't even want to get into that. Um, but it's legit and you can look it up online, go to, um, the skin cancer foundation or, um, many other, um, credible sources and you can find out that kind of stuff. But, um, the biggest thing right now is just when I see people that I care about and I know still abusing their skin, it literally, I just want to scream. I just want to grab them and be like, what are you doing? Why, why are you doing this? I don't want you to end up like me. I don't want you to end up um, like all these people that I know and love that are dealing with this, y'all, this is scary stuff. And it's not like, I have been very knock on wood. I've been very, very lucky, um, so far. And, um, I'm actually grateful that I was diagnosed because the way I destroyed my skin for 15 years, it was a matter of time before something like this was going to happen to me. And I always think about like, what if my parents weren't there that weekend? Or what if, my mom didn't notice the mole or what if I had been stubborn and ignored her, um, wishes and not gone to the doctor. Like I actually still listen to my parents sometimes, <laughs> sometimes, most of the time. And, um, I just, it's like, if I hadn't done that, y'all, I might not even be here and I'm not trying to be dramatic. Like that's legit. And it makes me sad to think that, um, my behavior could have, you know, my fate could have been very different. Um, the blessing behind this is that my mom, as soon as I was diagnosed was like, okay, we're all going to the dermatologist. So she and my dad, and my sister started going religiously and still do. I think my parents go more often than I do now. Um, but they all go religiously. My sister has been so good with her family. She has two girls, nine and 11 and her husband and it's like she's teaching them how to be safe and like you know they go to the dermatologist and um my mom has told my story to some of their friends and like one of her golf friends um actually went home and told her husband about it and said you need to get that mole checked on wherever it was on him I don't know it ended up being melanoma so like sharing this I've learned that um you know because one person dies of this horrible disease every hour. If one person listens to what I have to say, um, and thinks twice before they go out and lay out in the sun, or they <sighs> thinks twice about going to a tanning bed or tells their friend, you know, Hey, I just saw that mole on your leg. Have you seen that? You should probably get that checked. Like if what I am saying, if my, <laughs> my stupidity in my younger years and my knowledge and passion now causes you to do something that actually prevents you from going through this or helps you find something early so that you can hopefully be okay or someone in your family like I feel like then I've done my job then my diagnosis was actually I think it was meant to happen to me um but I'm grateful that it did because like I said if it if it didn't happen when it did I don't know if I would still be here um so I guess after saying all this um you know if you have any questions about any of this stuff, feel free to message me. Um, if you have my number, text me. I would be more than happy to answer your questions. I'm not a dermatologist. I'm not a doctor. I am not an expert, but I'm a melanoma survivor, and I've been forced into learning what this world is all about. I've also been very active in the cancer community for 10 years. Um, I have a lot of friends who had a lot of different kinds of cancer, including melanoma and skin, other skin cancers. And I will say that, um, to all my friends who have had other types of cancer or who are fighting other kinds of cancer, or if y'all have friends or family members who are just because they're fighting lymphoma or liver cancer or, um, breast cancer, that doesn't mean they can't also get skin cancer. So they're already fighting for their lives. They're already going through treatments and trying to deal with, um, you know, the problem at hand. Or some of them, like many of my amazing survivor friends who are like walking miracles, um, fought their cancer. They beat their cancer. 
they went through hell and back and they're still here and they're living well and thriving, but they're still at risk. Like skin cancer doesn't discriminate. So please don't think that just because you've gone through some other thing that that means that you're immune to this. Like this can happen to anybody. Um, in fact, I remember a friend of mine who had, went through lymphoma um, years later, like he was doing great. And then years later he ended up with um, uh, skin cancer and he was like, after all I went through with my lymphoma treatment, now I have to deal with this. Are you kidding me? And it reminded me that I need to start reminding people of that, that it's, um, you know, skin cancer, it doesn't, it doesn't discriminate. It can happen multiple times. Um, my friend Robin in San Diego, many of you know her, I mean, rock star. She just had her, I think 16th anniversary from her original melanoma diagnosis, but she's had many melanomas and other skin cancers since many surgeries, many treatments, like, I mean, she's amazing. And, but she's been going through this for 16 years, nonstop biopsies, treatments, um, you name it, reconstructive surgery on her nose to like essentially rebuild her nose because of the melanoma that she had there. So, I mean, um, it, the melanoma people who are maybe watching this, um, you know, they're all going to like it, maybe comment because they know, they know what I'm talking about. It's everybody else that doesn't know. Like I, I hope that I have gotten through to some of y'all or all of y'all tonight. Um, in some way, I hope one point I made resonated with you and you will take it with you and think about it the next time you go outside. And let me reiterate, cause in Texas it gets freaking hot in the summer, but I remember at one point since I've been living here, somebody said like, like, oh, I guess I better go get some sunscreen because summer's coming and it's going to be hot. It doesn't have to be hot. It doesn't even have to be sunny <laughs> for you to get sun damage, sunburn, skin cancer. Um, it, it, the sun doesn't have to be out. Um, we have these lovely weather apps on our phones now that actually tell you the UV uh, rating at the time. So I always look, even though I pretty much dress the same when I take Max on our walks in the morning. Now that we've been in quarantine mode, I've, I've been doing a morning walk with him. And um, I, I mean, I dress the same, I cover him up the same, but I always look to see what the, U, the UV rating is. Um, there was one day I was gonna try to take him on a walk on my lunch break um, instead of in the morning. And by the time I looked at my phone and saw the UV rating was like a nine or 10, I was like, sorry, dude, we're not taking our walk till tonight. We're not going out there. Um, so I used to think the UV rating topped out at 10, but it actually goes higher than that. So make sure you're looking at that. Pay attention. I think you'll be surprised on some days how high it is. Um, yes, the summer weather and the heat can often bring higher UV um, ratings, but cloudy days, the sun is still there. And I know a lot of times people tell me like they got one of their worst sunburns on a cloudy day. So um, you got to protect your eyes too. Melanoma can ap appear in your eyes. Ocular melanoma, it is not cool, y'all. The people that I follow that, that have that or who have unfortunately passed away from that, they have their battles are nuts and it is scary. So when I actually go to the eye doctor, I have pretty perfect vision for my family because everyone in my family has glasses. But um, one thing I love is that because I've had melanoma, my eye doctor actually takes a, a special like retinal like picture of my eyes to make sure there's no lesions on my eyeballs. Like, I mean, of all places, right? So wear sunglasses. Like it's so simple. Wear hats so that your eyes are not getting hit all the time by the sun. Um, and Remember, again, melanoma can pop up in places that have never seen the sun. Um, sorry, but it can be like in your butt crack. It can be in all kinds of other places that I don't need to mention because you all know where they are. Um, it can be in between your toes. Um, it can be under your hair. Um, it, again, it can be, you don't have to be a sunbather or a tanning salon person like I was before um, for it to pop up. It could show up in a place that has never seen the sun. So that is why checking yourself, just like people are supposed to do, you know, self breast exams every month, you really should be doing a skin exam every month, checking yourself out. 
um, take pictures, take selfies, have your family members or your friends take picture of your back, like monitor yourself in between when you're seeing the dermatologist because you need to be seeing a dermatologist at least once a year. And I say at least once because if you are in a higher risk category, if you have a family history, you really should be going like every six months. Um, and once you've had melanoma, you, for, you first you start out going every three months for a while, then you graduate to six months. And at one point I was told I could wait uh, to come back in a year, but then something new popped up on my skin and I was like, I'm not waiting that long. So I still go every six months. I, I, whatever insurance pays for, I don't even care anymore because it's not worth, I'm not gonna put my life on, on the line for my insurance. If I have to pay more, I pay more. Um, and biopsies aren't usually cheap, especially with insurance plans nowadays, but it is what it is and it's worth it. Um, uh, because that biopsy I had in 2008 saved my life and my mom saved my life. So if your mom bugs you about a mole, listen to her. Um, if you're a mom, bug your kids, bug your husbands, um, bug your parents, your family members. Like, remember that gut instinct you have. It's, it is not, it's not to be messed with. So, um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Um, if y'all are looking for a way to give back and support the melanoma community, um, my amazing friend, Eric Martin, he is, has been battling stage four melanoma for, I want to say almost eight years now. His battle has been insane. He just, he's been through hell, 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 hell. And he is so strong and he just keeps, he just keeps powering through because he has an amazing wife and he has amazing kids and a great family and I know them all and they're wonderful. And he founded Stage Free Melanoma, which is, um, it's based out in San Diego. Up, He's in Escondido, I believe, or no, actually they moved even north of there, but beside the point, it's based out in Southern California um, and they raise money to, um, they originally raised money to um, outfit an old school bus that was donated to them. Um, and it is now a traveling dermatology clinic that can, that will do free skin cancer screenings for people, which is so cool. Um, but obviously right now with everything that's going on in the world, they're not able to do that, but they will pick it back up again whenever they, like as soon as they can, I know. But, um, and that, so now they raise funds to help, um, put on those clinics and, um, provide resources to people and free sunscreen and it's just it's badass and I'm so proud of him and um, so if you're looking to give back especially to a small organization that is really truly just getting going and they need every dollar and every ounce of help they can get um, just look up stage free melanoma um, they're on Facebook and Instagram and they have a website um, they can use all the support they can get. And I know once they get going again out in San Diego, I'm sure they could use volunteers at their events and, um, you know, people to help them do what they do and get their mission out there. So, um, with that said, if you or anyone, you know, needs a speaker to talk about this stuff, whether it be melanoma awareness, um, sharing my survivor story and connecting with other cancer survivors, not just um, skin cancer, but just cancer survivors in general. Um, speaking to caregivers, um, I've been a caregiver too for too many people that have had cancer. Um, or if you work at a company that does, um, you know, a wellness week or, um, you know, um, health awareness day or whatever it may be, and they're looking for a speaker to come and talk or even to virtually now, we can't really come and talk anymore with the state of the world, but, um, I could talk virtually. I mean, I could jump on a zoom call. I could do Skype. I mean, we can, we can still get the word out to people. Um, being stuck or safe at home is not an excuse, which is why I'm doing this right now. Cause I can still get the word out to people. So, um, I promise it won't be this long of a speech unless they want it to be. And this isn't even a speech. This is just me talking, but, um, I've given speeches as short as two minutes and I give it speeches as long as like 45. So I can talk 
however long y'all need me to, and I can tailor it to my audience. And um, I've even spoken to elementary school kids, which was really fun. Um, I had to really think about how I told my story um, and the words I chose to use and, um, you know, uh, the slides I showed them and um, I, it was, it was really cool though. So um, if anybody out there would like me to talk to their group or their Girl Scout troop or their classroom or their company or whoever it is, let me know. Um, I would be more than happy. I really miss public speaking. Um, I did it for, like I said, um, about four solid years in San Diego. And then I did it a little bit here the first year or two that I lived in Austin, but I really have not had the opportunity to do it, which is why I post about it on Facebook and why I'm doing this because I just feel like, I just feel like the word needs to get out there and I need to speak up for people who can't, people who aren't here anymore to tell their stories for their family members who miss them. Um, and, uh, I just feel like it makes the most sense for me to do it like this. So for those of you that have watched this or will watch this, thank you. Um, for those of you that have been on the whole time, I think there might only be two or three of you that have lasted this long. Thank you. Um, I will make this post public. Feel free to share it. Um, I am an open book and this is my life and this is part of who I am, but it's also part of what I'm hoping is like my way of giving back and, and hopefully preventing other people from dealing with this because, um, I don't want any of y'all to get that phone call that <laughs> when they tell you you have cancer, like your life is never the same. And, uh, you know, every biopsy, every time you have to wait again to get test results, every time they tell you you're fine, it's great. You, you celebrate, but then it's like, okay, on to the next six months. And that's just not, I have a great life, but that's not a, a great way to go through life. And so, um, just don't make the same mistakes I did. And, um, don't let your friends and family members do it, please. It's just not worth it. It really isn't. If you really want to look tan, there are ways you can do it without hurting yourself. Um, but I will tell you, and this is the last part of my story. So I, um, after I was diagnosed, it was summer still. So I had my tan for a few more months cause I had, I had, you know, been getting my tan for a while. So it took a while to fade. And I remember as soon as it started to fade, I started to feel very, um, like ashamed of what I looked like. Um, because I had been used to having like color pretty much for 15 years, so color of some kind. And, um, so I remember that was kind of when the mystic tans and the fake like spray tans were really, really getting perfected. And it was like really in back then. <laughs> Never mind the fact that you could tell that you had had a spray tan, but whatever, it's fine. It, it was a vain thing. I did not like what I looked like. Um, I didn't like my natural skin color and I associated it with the 15 years of destroying my skin that I had just done to cause me to have what could have been a life threatening, um, diagnosis. And so I used to do like the spray tans and I used like the self tanning lotions all the time. And, um, cause I just did, I couldn't stand the thought of being my natural skin color. So, um, I, um, I remember when I met David, my now husband, um, I was still using that stuff and it, we met in August of, um, 2014. And so it had been six years of me, you know, kind of having this like fake tan, um, non UV related. And I remember like at, as the summer kind of, um, died down, I was like, God, I'm sick of putting this crap on my skin. Like, you know, I had met him. He, he didn't like me because of my skin color. Um, he didn't care about that stuff. So I finally just was like, why am I doing this? Like, and that, I remember that fall and winter came and I just stopped using that stuff and I haven't used any since. I didn't even use any before our wedding. <laughs> I didn't get a spray tan. I didn't do anything. I, Cause by the time we got married, that was, um, like four years later, I just was like, this is what I look like. This is what I look like. That's it. Like I'm embracing it. And it has been so, um, 
such a weight lifted off of me. Like, this is just what I look like. I now dress for it. I put my makeup on, you know, for my real skin. Um, I'm not trying to match my tan anymore. And it's, honestly, I don't get compliments on my skin anymore. Or like, I used to get like, oh, you look so tan. You look so great. Like, you know, that was part of what fueled me. I'm a... Um, words of affirmation, love language person. So I got, when I would get compliments when I was tan about how good I looked, I mean, you better believe that that fueled my self-esteem and my, um, you know, my confidence in myself. So, but it's reversed now. Like now when I see those pictures of myself, I just cringe and I just get so mad at the old me. Like why, 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 why did you do that? And it's like, now I don't even think twice about what my skin looks like because this is my skin and I got to take care of it. <laughs> and so, um, I guess I'll leave you with that. Um, love the skin you're in, take care of it. Um, go get checked. Um, wear sunscreen. What's the best sunscreen? Whatever one you will wear correctly. I'm not even going to get into the sunscreen debate because that's, that's for another day. But there are many options out there, including ones that aren't full of chemicals, um, so that are very safe. There are ones that are very safe for babies and kids um, that are natural, mineral-based. Um, they're physical sunscreens. Um, like, but again, whatever you will wear correctly. Read the directions. You got to reapply, and you can't use that as a, as a um, like wearing sunscreen doesn't make it okay for you to be out there roasting in the sun. It's, it's a barrier, yes, but it's not a cure-all. So just please be careful. Look out for yourself. Um, and again, I would be more than happy to talk to your group, uh, whoever that may be, um, whether it be in person in Austin or um, via the internet. <laughs> I can jump online and do this all over again in a much more formal, organized way. Um, I have slides, I have photos, I have statistics. I can be as low key or professional as you would like. And, um, I would, it would make my day to have the opportunity to speak again, um, in whatever fashion it may be. So in the meantime, I will do it like this. And I appreciate any of y'all who have listened and watched. And, um, if you have any questions, like I said, feel free to comment here. Um, send me a message, send me a text, whatever way you'd like to reach me. Um, if I don't know the answer, I will certainly figure it out for you or I will point you in the right direction because I know a lot of people in this world, the melanoma world, who are way more educated and um, have way more expertise than I do. And they would be probably very happy to talk to you. So um, if you need a recommendation for a dermatologist in... St. Louis, San Diego, or um, Denver, or Austin, let me know, because I have personal <laughs> connections in all those cities. Um, I miss you too, V. Thank you. Um, and I'd be happy to give you their names. Um, but otherwise, I think that is it. I am going to sign off and put my feet up <laughs> and relax for a little bit, because as a full-time working from home, 24 seven mom right now. I don't get to do that very much. And, um, so I'm going to do that, but I have been wanting to do this for so long and it feels so good to get this off my chest. And I really appreciate any amount of this video that you have watched and have listened to. And I hope that it resonates with you and I hope that you will, um, take it to heart and, um, yeah. So I look forward to, interacting with y'all on Facebook and maybe Instagram if I can figure out how to share this over there. And um, I hope y'all have a good night. Take care and thank you again for listening.